committee member and emeritus professor at the University of Warwick in the Department of Computer Science, where he specializes in the history of computing, and his intriguing title is The History of Computing in Color. Over to you, Martin. I have to, um, I can fairly blame Doran Swade for this talk, um, who's not here today, <laughs> um, who told me he couldn't be here today. But um, about a year ago, um, he asked if I would contribute to a conference. Um, and I said, well, actually, I've not done anything. I haven't anything new to report. So he pressed me. I said, well, I do have a germ of an idea. Um, give me a fortnight, and uh, I'll come back to you. So around that fortnight, I sort of thought about this. This is presentation is really, it's the second showing actually, I've, I've given the talk for Doran uh, a few months ago. Um, <coughs> and at the time I had just encountered this book called, uh, I think the title was World War II in Colour. And um, the interesting thing about it was, uh, or the point being made by the authors, was that the archives were full of colour pictures from, the world, from World War II. But nobody ever looked at them because you'd never been able to print them, so there was not much point in exploiting them. Um, but suddenly, with the advent of low-cost colour printing, which really came in the mid-90s, you know, suddenly this, people started to look in archives again. And you've probably seen there's been lots of programmes on the TV as well, um, of sort of um, uh, World War II in colour, there's lots of war, war films, you know, sort of Hitler in colour and so forth. Um, this is a... a, a Interesting picture, a couple of pictures here, but you know what, why colour makes a difference. And on the left there is a, is a picture of taking the Coventry Blitz, which ought to be more poignant, really. I mean, it, it's a tremendous tragedy, and yet it's the one on the right that, that draws your eye, and because the colour is, is very potent. I mean, it's another human tragedy, but not on the scale of the Coven, of the Coven Trojan. Um, but you know, as your eyes wander around that picture, you, you pick out that, that little budgery gar in yellow, you know, the, the line on the bathroom floor, and it, it's all full, full of detail. So when I was looking at the World War II in colour books, well, one of the books had a, a section about the bombing of Stuttgart, which was interesting to me because I never knew that Stuttgart was bombed, and Dresden is the one that you think of as being bombed. Because it turns out that there was a, a man who had to have colour film in his camera, you know, and that's what's in the archive. So in fact, this book actually takes you through, through, through some quite different pathways through through uh, computing. And that was the what, what I wanted to explore. Whether if you looked to see what was actually if there were coloured images in the archive, where it would take you. And what I found was um, there's really no colour imagery inside archives that's sort of central really to, to the subject that interests us all, which is sort of to do with the mechanics of computers and the electronics of computers. And I found myself pushed towards sort of peripheries um, of social history uh, and labour history and, and design history, all of which are you know, big academic disciplines in their own right. If they were drawing, if, what a, if a social historian was drawing a map of the world of history, it wouldn't look like mine. You know. <laughs> social history would be the big circle in the centre. <clears throat> so anyway, um, let me, uh, so I'm going to talk about three of those, those histories, but I want first uh, to spend a few, about a quarter of the lecture, um, that's about quarter of an hour, <laughs> uh, just talking about colour processes and you know, what, what sort of colour, colour images you find. Um, one of the things about colour is that it's a cliche that every picture tells a, a story. So you recognise they're sort of the same image. One of them, um, the photographs of Vannevar Bush, the inventor of the differential analyzer and sort of the leading um, the equivalent of Douglas Hartree in America, sort of the, lead, the leading computer person in the United States before the Second World War. Um, on the right, uh, there's a picture of him with, with a, a photo typesetting system he's invented, taken back in 1949. And on the left, in this magazine, uh, Popular Mechanics, uh, you know, an artist has redrawn this. And the picture on the left is fundamentally more interesting um, because it, it 
tells you there's sort of more messages in it than there is on the picture on the right. So, for example, it tells us actually that, that uh, Bush was well enough known, I thought he was quite a, um, an esoteric figure, but it turns out, you know, he's well enough known that he could feature on the cover of Popular Mechanics. Obviously, you know, it would sell magazines, they knew who he was. And if you look at the bottom uh, of that image, there's a picture of uh, Abraham Lincoln there, Mark Twain, who were also amateur inventors. So, you know, they're classifying him in this tradition of amateur invention, which I thought was something that had disappeared at an earlier time. But obviously, the boundaries between professional invention and amateur invention were much more sort of porous then than they are now. And here's the bit. This is the machine that, uh, that he invents. Um, differential analyzer. Uh, this is the only known color image, actually, uh, of, the, of the differential analyzer. And you'll see on the left what you've got is a, a standard glass plate negative, uh, which is not an interesting and is very widely reproduced in textbooks on the history of computing. The one on the right uh, has, has never been reproduced as far as I know. Um, and uh, again, this tells you sort of things. You know, they call it the the super calculating machine, and it appears in a set of cigarette cards, 1938. Um, it's a modern wonder of the world, and you know, there's a text on the back that tells you that it augments the human brain, and, and so forth. So there's kind of a rich sort of history um, attached to that. Well, anyway, um, let me get on to talking about uh, sources of, of uh, colour imagery. There's really two sorts. There are the photographs, or it's something that's been printed. So. Um, of course, originally, you know, photography sort of gets going really in the Victorian era, and there is no, no colour film. Really, until the 1940s, you don't get colour film. So you, you have different ways of introducing colour uh, into a photograph. You're probably very familiar with, uh, with sepia-toned photographs. You know, you've probably got them from your, your grandparents in a, in a box somewhere in the family archive. Um, People often think that sepia was a, sort of a photographic defect. It's not so. Um, what it is actually, it's a chemical process. So actually most photographs, all photographs are black and white, um, but they were often toned in this sepia tone, which just gave them a sort of a more mellow look. Um, but it wasn't just sepia, so the, um, Burroughs Welcome specialised in making different toners for, uh, for photographs. So they did blue and yellow and red. And, copper tones, an uh, interesting colour. Um, this is an example that they give, not related to the history of computing, but it shows how effective actually toning can be. Um, it, it, if you can imagine that picture of, of you know, taken at the, at, uh, the Antarctic, um, that would not look so good in black and white. The effect of the colour toning there is really quite striking, I think. Here's some examples from the computer domain. The one at the bottom uh, is an iconic one. It, it's actually 1929, and it's the Moore School of Electrical Engineering, uh, where the computer was invented by John von Neumann and others a, a few years later. The one at the top um, is of uh, an IBM card program calculator. But it's interesting, the, the toning serves no purpose there, really. Uh, the green, to me, adds nothing to it. But on the bottom one, I think, it does it looks more interesting, I think, than in, in black and white. So that's toning. Um, another thing you could do would be tinting, which is where you, uh, you selectively colour an image. Um, usually a fairly narrow range of, of uh, colours. So if you look at this, you'll see that there's a, an awful lot of the women are either wearing pink or turquoise blouses, you know, which suggests you know, the limited range uh, of colours that you have. This is actually a mechanically produced um, uh, tint. It's a photograph. Um, it's a, produced as a postcard. It's actually a sepia photograph, and then it's been mechanically tinted um, with sort of four, I think it's four extra colours that are, are layered on top. <clears throat> this is a true colour photograph. Um, Coda colour uh, was invented, I think, in 1938. Ag for colour a little bit earlier in 36. So actually, colour photography is really quite late onto the scene, and it's extremely rare to find colour photographs uh, of anything interesting to do with computers you know, before, uh, say, uh, the late 40s. So this is the only colour photograph I've seen of John von Neumann. Well, there is one other, but it's not a very good photograph. 
Um, you see here is Oscar Mor Morgenstern, who was a, a collaborator in economics, and it was taken by Morgenstern's wife um, sometime in the 1940s, I, I guess, um, after the war. Um, it's just a fantastic photograph of John von Neumann. Uh, there's nothing like it. And uh, obviously, Mrs. Morgenstern was a pretty accomplished photographer. That, that's a really good, good photograph. <clears throat> Another source of uh, colour photographs are, are film. Um, interestingly, you get colour film much more quick, long before you get, get colour photographs. The reason for that um, was that by the 1930s, slides and colour and movie film had sort of replaced magic lantern projectors. Um, and of course, there was no additional cost to using colour uh, with a projector. It, I, it worked with black and white all with colour, so there was a good reason to use, use colour film, which was obviously quite expensive. In the case of printed materials, they were always in black and white, really, until the 1980s. Uh, so there was no benefit in photographing in colour. Um, this film actually, I think, people, I think it's been shown, I think, in one of the, one of the winter things, but um, sort of, uh, they're rather f um, fuzzy sort of pictures because all industrial films were shot on 16 millimeter stock, so they're tiny little negatives, so it's not particularly crisp, but I don't know if people would recognise um, Stratford Johns there in the top picture from, from Z Cars. Yes. <laughs> Well, um, so that's photographic sources, printed sources. Um, is that until uh, really the early years of the 20th century, everything in printed materials is an engraving, uh, which is to say it, it's basically a hand-drawn picture. Um, and the typical arrangement was they were always being printed in, in the same colour as the print. It's a letterpress process, so you, you, you put a, uh, an engraving into the block of type and then printed it. Um, but if you were wealthy, uh, you, you could get your books hand-coloured. So, it's, I don't think you can read it in front, but if you looked on the top of this, the top line, I think, more or less, it says um, uh, that this volume costs eight shillings, or ten and six, with the engravings coloured. So, you know, people were employed, a bit like um, plate, plate painting in the potteries, you know, women would be employed to sort of hand-colour these uh, images. I think this is just a fantastic image. Image it comes from the Mary Evans uh, picture library. So um, on the right uh, is the original there, which is in um, black and white engraving from the Illustrated London News. Um, and the Mary Evans library sort of uh, acquired it and asked them where they got it from. They had no idea, but they said that Mary Evans, who's long since died, um, used to go around to flea markets buying buying uh, anything that looked interesting. So they have a, an amazing range of stuff. Um, this is the almost the first, well, one of the very first printed books and certainly the first printed book uh, in a domain, domain mathematics that's sort of closely related to ours. And how that's done is it's conventional um, type and then it's uh, printed with wooden blocks so that this is printed in four more, four, I think it's four different colours. Uh, there's only three of these images I think which is yellow uh, red and blue. So blocks are cut out of wood, uh, are then pressed, ink and then pressed onto the onto the page. And you do that three times for the three different colours. Um, the registration is amazingly good when you think it was all done done by hand. <clears throat> so that's 1847. Um, that technique of sort of adding sort of blocks of colour in that way. Uh, gets the name spot colour. Um, that's a term that emerges, I think, sometime between the war or perhaps a lot earlier. Uh, and you can see on the left there, um, it's basically a black and white um, advertisement, and then uh, sort of colour has been laid onto it just basically to jazz it up and make it look a bit more uh, visually, visually attractive, which is what's the purpose of advertising. Um, if you took a magnifying glass to that, um, you would see that it's a pure colour. Um, there's no, uh, no half tones on it, on, on the blue there. It's just a solid block of colour, 
just like one I showed you earlier. Same on the right, which is from the 1960s, that's from ICT, showing the same sort of equipment uh, in its streamlined version. Um, and again, there's uh, blue and yellow, and I think, oh, and red there, just at the top. So again, it's just three sort of primary colours that are, are laid on. You get more interesting colour printing with what is used to call chromal lithography. And lithography is a technique where the image was placed, the printing surface is a flat stone, and the ink is laid on it, and then you put a paper on that. But there are many variations of the actual technique. Um, and um, so litho refers to stone, actually. So this is an, an example. And unlike modern printing, which is usually just three colors, um, they would have a whole range of colors. Um, and this technique was very expensive, you can imagine. Um, so Baxter prints, you have some have heard of those. Uh, the sort of the pioneer in England, starting about the 1850s or 60s. And they were mainly done as, as pictures that you would frame and have on the wall. And they would have any, anything up to 20 colours. So this is actually just the first page of the, of the palette that this particular printer offers. Um, there are like, there's another two pages of that, so there's many, many different colours. Um, this is a, a real rare thing, actually, um, a demonstration piece showing the application of these colours. So um, I think it's in, in black and magenta and uh, blue and yellow and grey and something else. I can't quite read it. Yet. There's, there's actually uh, six colours in black, I think, there. That's wrong. What did I say? Six colours in black, yeah. Um, and, of course, you get a sort of a, a very attractive print indeed. Um, so these are two examples of, of uh, lithographs. Um, the one on the right uh, is a very common kind of postcard that you've got uh, around the turn of the century. Um, in fact, just for fun, try, try to type, put in typewriter and postcard into eBay and be surprised how many of these things were produced. It was bicycles and typewriters were sort of the really great technologies of that era. Um, the one on the left uh, is a, a lithograph of a <coughs> Jacquard loom of the kind that Babbage envisaged for the analytical engine. So if you look on the table there, you can see the, the punch cards there. Also, um, it's not just lithography, but obviously the, the, the technique also moves to, as it gets perfected, that moves on to conventional letterpress printing that you get in ordinary magazines rather than frame prints. So on the left there, this is actually from a Comptometer publication, um, and it shows the Comptometer in use. So that is just one colour, so it's brown and, and black. But again, it, it's much more visually striking than simply a monochrome image. And one on the right, um, is quite a glorious thing uh, uh, from Dalton, Dalton Adam machine, both around about, both 1919. Then finally, we get to um, kind of a more modern technique, which is usually called the <coughs> me, the three colour process. And um, how that works then is that the the original is photographed uh, three times, through or four times if you're using black through three colours, so red, yellow, and blue, or green, I think, more usually. Um, and then you make three different plates, and then print them uh, with, with the corresponding ink. Uh, and so this one is actually, the one on the left is in fact a three colour image, so there's no black in that particular one. The one on the right is a more traditional one, then it has three colours plus black. And the black actually sort of enables you to get better blacks, and also economises on ink. Otherwise, you need three layers of ink uh, to get black. This is a technique which has just vanished. It's called a, a duo term. Um, extremely attractive. Um, the picture comes from um, a, a book called The Origins of the Calculator Machine, I think, uh, 1926. Uh, and how it's done is that it consists, the original would have been a, a, just a, a watercolour done in, done in grey, you know, done in, uh, uh, in black ink, basically. Um, then it's photographed twice. Once it's photographed just straight, then that's used for the black. 
And then you would photo re-photograph it using a flash, and that has the effect of bringing in all, all the image. So there are many variants of doing this. So you get this effect on the, on the left there. I wrote a book in 1976, uh, which is the one in the middle there, um, using this. As, and I always think this was the, the nadir of printing. It was, it was a film set, and it just completely flattens that image. Uh, it's extraordinary and exciting, isn't it? Um, uh, and the one on the right um, was actually a Japanese translation of my book. Um, but they didn't rescreen the photographs <laughs> so that, so that they'd been reproduced a second time. So then it's looking like a really uninteresting image. You just compare that with the one on the left. Um, it's actually rather hard to represent this um, on kind of modern printing or projection technique, actually. When you look at the original, you know, it really is very attractive. I've mentioned, um, I ought to mention some of these different printing techniques. So you have letterpress, lithography, and gravure. Now, letterpress um, is what you used to get, say, until about 1980 in newspapers. Um, uh, and it's where you have raised type and it sort of heads into the paper. It has very good adhesion, the ink really sticks. Um, everything now, almost everything, is printed by offset lithography, where the ink is put on rubber rollers and then transferred to the paper, so it has rather poor adhesion which is why when you read the newspaper in bed, you get ink all over the sheets that one never used to. And I suppose why Prince Charles is alleged to have his newspaper ironed in the morning. Um, the one on the right is called gravia, and that uh, is called a, a recess technique. So if you think of letterpress, it's kind of a raised surface that's inked. Litho is just a surface that's inked. And then gravia is sort of like a, a pit, so that you get a lot of ink into it. Um, the people here, that are, a lot of you are old enough to have used the Children's Encyclopedia. I don't know if you remember, it used to have sort of architectural and, and uh, artistic subjects. And they were always in sort of green colour or, or brown, if you remember that. Um, that's gravia. So this is an example, um, a rather famous example. Uh, it's uh, Tom Kilburn and Freddie Williams in front of the Manchester machine uh, from the illustrated London News. Um, uh, if you look very carefully at the one on the left, you can actually see the pinstripe uh, on Tom's, Tom's jacket, on his suit jacket. So actually the, the, the depth of this picture is just so much better than the one on the right, um, which was taken from the same negative uh, at Manchester University and was reproduced in, uh, in Simon Lavington's book um, in 2012, so that's very recent. And a, a perfectly satisfactory reproduction, but really sort of no contest with the, the one on the left. Um, very hard to reproduce uh, again because uh, everything is offset live though now, so you don't get this, uh, this depth of, of ink. Right, um, I'm going to talk now about uh, sort of three three short histories um, that were sort of revealed by by looking at, at this these different images. Um, these are all concerned companies which are, you know, it's IBM and Seven Dwarfs, well this is IBM and, and two of the dwarfs, which are NCR and Remington Rand. Um, so let me start then by talking about uh, NCR and, and corporate welfare. So this is an area um, that NCR is very familiar in the history of computing textbooks, but almost invariably from sort of the technical viewpoint. Um, the firm starts in 1884 uh, by John Patterson, who's sort of a very famous entrepreneur in the United States. Um, and that's uh, actually a rotogravia uh, image on the right of their sort of early product. Um, NCR is really famous, uh, and Patterson is most famous, as the inventor of American salesmanship. So on the left there is the, is the company Song, dates from 1906, very early. Um, and on the right uh, is sort of one of their typical advertisements sort of uh, extolling the, the quality of their sales force. Um, it's interesting that Tom Watson, of course, was the sales manager at IBM, at, uh, at NCR, and he got fired in 1914 and then moved to what became IBM. So in fact, when you look at all the early practices in IBM, actually are transferred directly from NCR to sort of a, a somewhat underappreciated fact. Anyway, I wasn't going to talk about the, um, uh, 
the salesmanship aspect of um, of MCR, but ra rather the um, sort of the, the social aspect of it. I hope you'll find it interesting, but I must warn you, it's not very much to do with computing, except that it's all part of the hinterland of a famous computer company. Well, that's a picture of the NCR plant in 1893. So the firm now is uh, 10 years old, and I think it's got uh, a couple of thousand, uh, 1,200 employees and so many patents and so forth. Um, pretty standard, salt, smoky, uh, ugly factory. Now, um, it's around this time that John Patterson has, has uh, his epiphany. Um, it happens that they're exporting quite well by this time, as you can see from the information on that thing. And uh, they send a consignment of cash registers to England, and they return because they, they're unusable and have defects. $50,000 worth. And you know, this is a sort of, you know, financial blip. And uh, when they checked at the cash register, they discovered they've actually been vandalized. And uh, as a result, Patterson realized that he has an unhappy workforce and decides to sort of sit on the shop floor for a few weeks and, you know, and look. Um, and what he discovers is that the factory is horrible. I mean, it's no worse than other factories at the time, but you know, there's tiny windows, very poor light. Um, no, no washing with facilities to speak of, you know, fairly disgusting at that. Um, there's no canteen, people sort of have to eat their lunch you know, on the shop floor. Uh, so pretty gruesome uh, situation. So he decides that he's, gonna, he's got to expand the factory, so he decides to rebuild it. Um, and this is a, sort of a, a, a section of the factory that he decides to build. And he coins the term daylight factory. Uh, and his idea is that he wants a factory that is filled with light and beautifully landscaped. And it's an extraordinary vision, really. Um, now, he's not the first person, I think, to have an estate, but he certainly want, there's three or four people who sort of do the same thing somewhat spontaneously. And this is the factory he creates. The walls actually are, his target is 80% glass uh, on the walls. Um, this on the right uh, is the inventions department. Again, another name which gets transferred to IBM, but having a dedicated invention plant. Uh, on the left there just shows the working conditions. Actually, that's a copper tone print it shows up there. It's there quite rare. Um, and you can just see the workmen there with this terrific light uh, that they're, they're working under. Uh, kind of thought of quite advanced for the time. And that's the plant as it looks about 1910 as it's gradually expanding. So it's, it's an absolutely enormous thing. Um, it's now owned by, by uh, a university in Dayton. It's long since gone. Um, <clears throat> and these are, he gets uh, a firm called uh, the Armstead Brothers uh, to landscape the factory, uh, who normally do public parks and so forth. Um, and the landscaping is beautiful, actually. So this is called the Vista, uh, which is sort of the sign of, of all the factory buildings. On the bottom right there, it's called the English Garden. The idea is that the the workers and kind of promenade there during their, their lunch hours. Um, John Patterson, um, as part of this social mission for his workers, wanted, wanted to educate them. And he believed the best way to educate was, was visually. Uh, so he um, started producing magic lantern slides, and this is one. They're the only um, colour photograph. Uh, of uh, John Patterson standing on the left there, uh, with Orville Wright, who was the Dayton uh, flight pioneer. And the person in the middle, I had not heard of him as an explorer, but some perhaps will know who he was. Um, now, uh, he eventually, um, there are 60,000 uh, slides that, 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 their, that their photographic department produces, and he employs a team of seven women hand colouring these, these slides. So it's an enormous production. And lots of the archives still exist. So this is a massive archive of um, Magic Lantern slides uh, at, at Dayton Museum, which is where these, some of these come from. Um, well, th this is the kind of thing uh, that's going on at um, NCL. So one of his ideas is, is, uh, is welfare, uh, is um, sort of health and safety, so as we call it now. He sends his photographers uh, round to other factories 
to sort of photograph what's going on. And when you see something that's sort of uh, innovative or safe, uh, he, he introduces it. So this on the left there, um, these are grinding machines and they've, they've got dust covers on and, and safety and I think there's an extractor fan attachment. You know, incredibly advanced uh, and un, you know, technology for those. It was not the typical industry practice. And on the right, you know, a physical examination of an employee. And when you think this is actually you know, before the year 1900, it's, it's kind of an extraordinary thing. The only comparison you can make really would be with uh, Port Sunlight. Uh, in Britain and, and Bourneville, with this kind of paternalism. Um, the one on the left there shows the, the, the dining hall. Um, interesting, initially the lunches are free, uh, and sort of a, a kind of resentment from the workers that they don't like being patronised quite that much, so they introduce a charge. Um, and on the right, uh, this is a sort of lunchtime entertainment, so they would be have a lecture that would involve these many coloured slides, would be the typical subject for a, a lunchtime lecture. <clears throat> On the left there, um, just more factory scenes, the Future Demands Department. Interestingly, that's a title that IBM is still using into the 1960s. Uh, you can see how completely they've taken over the uh, uh, sort of firm structure. Patent department on the right. <clears throat> um, the Factory was located in a district of Dayton called Slider Town, which was a, a slum area. Uh, and the factory sort of suddenly arriving there like a spaceship is, is deeply resented by the local population, um, most of whom are not sort of qualified to work there for you know, the, um, the poor. Uh, so um, he, he decides that what they will do is they rename it South Park and to, to try and uh, sort of raise the general tone of the place. Um, so he encourages, he builds some houses uh, so that his workers will live there rather than somewhere else. Um, and he encourages people who live there to beautify their gardens, to sort of beautify the area. He gets the Olmstead brothers to beautify the public areas and that people should do their own back gardens. Now his pedagogical technique was this before and after. So you'd have a, an old grainy black and white magic lantern slide to show the before. And then you'd have this nicely coloured uh, slide to show the after. So this is, this is the effect. It's rather interesting, this picture. It's just recently been reproduced in a book called um, Gardens of America, which is mostly about um, sort of, you know, famous, famous parklands and the, the houses of the great. Uh, but there's just this, <coughs> this sticking out like a sore thumb hat in the middle of it that, you know, not, not all, all gardens have to be huge and beautiful. Um, the other problem he has uh, is that the sort of the urchins of Slider Town um, uh, are throwing rocks <laughs> at, at, at the windows of the new factory and pulling up plants and setting things on fire. So he decides he needs to find some way of, uh, of um, containing youth. So he they set up a, pro a project uh, called the Boys' Gardens. He hires a welfare officer, again, said to be the first, uh, first person so employed. And her idea is to set up boys' gardens, so they give them seeds and tools and set aside some land. And the idea is that they'll spend their time gardening. Of course, they excel in produce, which is a good incentive. Um, the bottom right picture, by the way, is an actual photograph. It's, uh, it's an extremely early colour photograph. Um, the other one, of course, is a hand coloured image. Um, and in the, in the winter, uh, they have woodwork classes. And for girls, it's sewing classes the garden. Um, the factory becomes a, a, a sort of an industrial show place. People are very interested. It's called, called the Progressive Era uh, and, uh, by American historians. And people get very interested in this idea of industrial welfare. Um, most working conditions are truly terrible at that time in America. You have to read a book like, the, like uh, the Jungle or something to read how awful working conditions were, and, and probably over here too. Um, and. Uh, they started getting a trickle of visitors, mostly politicians and other industrialists and so forth. But eventually, people, it becomes almost a tourist attraction. Um, so as a result, they start feeling the need to produce postcards. Um, and there are, well, I've seen at least 100 postcards uh, of NCR during this period. Um, and I'm sure there's very many more. This is absolutely typical of them. This one, 1909, um, they get the entire factory workforce, men and women, to sort of 
<laughs> to show themselves and sit in front of the factory. And it's sort of an iconic thing, but uh, there are many variants of that particular photo. And I'll just show you some of the others because it sort of shows you the factory scenes. This shows the schoolhouse um, where, again, you have the lunchtime entertainment, but also to keep the children amused, there would be Saturday morning lectures and later film shows. Um, the top uh, postcard there shows um, the assembly of, of uh, um, a cash rate. Rather well, interesting, actually, that um, it's not a production line because they, they, they tend to be different. You know, they have many different features, they're quite bespoke. And in the bottom right there is, is the printing plant. Again, it's an enormous producer. It's not just postcards, but they produce you know, huge amounts of publicity material. Um, this shows the rather like a Japanese factory on the top left there. The executives were expected to, uh, to, uh, <laughs> to take exercise. It's a very, um, uh, um, <coughs> not entirely voluntary, I, I gather. And um, on the bottom right there, again, it's, it's a, a, a tennis. So these are just tourist photographs. This is a lovely photograph and kind of showing this happy band of employees. Um, kind of interesting, and, and um, actually they do have strikes, and there's quite a, quite a lot of dissidence about, about this, um, uh, this, um, uh, this patronage. You know, not everybody likes it, and, and it's anti-union, but, uh, but there, are, there are strikes. But anyway, um, so that's just sort of a glimpse then uh, of, uh, of what it would like at NCR. Um, so my next little history um, is sort of, I think you have probably call it labour history or office history. And um, <clears throat> it's about the business of, uh, of what we would now call a database, but how do you, um, how did you file large amounts of information? The American office was transformed in the last 10 years of the 19th century. So, as you know, the typewriters invented 1873, but it comes kind of perfected about 1886, with the invention of what you would recognize as a modern typewriter. And then it just sweeps through the office. Uh, so this is um, a particularly later photograph, I think about 1910. Um, and it, it's of uh, the publishers of Curtis Publishing, who do Saturday Evening Post and various others. So it's a very big operation. These uh, journals that, that they produce, selling millions of copies a week, you know, just before radio and TV, so it's a, a monster business. Um, this picture shows on the left, then, you've got, it uh, looks like about 40 people who are using uh, Edison dictating machines, and they're uh, responding to correspondence. Uh, you know, to writers to the firm. And on the right, you've got about 60 women, uh, typists as they're called, uh, typewriters they're called in that day, it's actually before that, uh, before they get called typists. And they've got transcribing machines um, and uh, uh, producing this correspondence, uh, you know, to, to send out. Um, it's obviously a faked photo because there's not a single sheet of, of new sleeve paper sitting around there, whereas of course, if you think about pictures of an office I showed you earlier, there's paper everywhere. Um, obviously stage for the camera. Uh, on the left of the picture there, I, just in the background, you can see those cabinets. Of course, they're, they're filing cabinets, and that's where these new sheets of correspondence are kept. So, before the typewriter, correspondence was typically entered into a, what's called a letter book. Uh, so, you would, you would write your reply in a letter book with a piece of carbon paper underneath. Then you would tear out the letter that was sent to the recipient, then you would have kept a copy. So it, it, it was really low volume, but this suddenly is a very high volume activity. Uh, the filing cabinet, the vertical filing cabinet, we need to take for granted, but it's an extraordinary invention when you think about it. Um, it's invented in 1892, so that's just six years after the typewriter is perfected. And it's no accident really that those two things happen together, because suddenly you've got loose sheets of paper everywhere that you need to contain. But by this time, uh, these photos, it, it's really become a commodity. Any patents would have expired if there were any patents. Um, and <clears throat> this is Rand. So Rand actually gets his um, his firm's established uh, creating filing systems. And what he does, uh, a word, the, the vogue word of the period is system. 
uh, it's the name of the main business magazine of the era. It's called Business Week now. It was called System when it first came out. Um, and his idea is to apply system to the business of vertical filing. And uh, so there's a couple of illustrations. How do you store this extraordinary amount of correspondence being generated by a firm of the size of Curtis Publishing? Well, on the left um, is the simplest system, which is called the alpha numeric system. Let me um, show you how it works uh, in my code matters. The, what you got from Remington Rand uh, was you told them how big, you, how big your filing problem was, and then they would supply. So, for example, the maximum was 30,000 folders, which is a pretty substantial uh, volume of correspondence. So that's individual correspondence. Um, and then there were, there were um, dividers. You can see that there's A, B, and C in that particular file just on the left there. And then they would be subdivided with the orange one, so it's green on the left, and then orange in the middle. So these are all produced by the firm. And then on the right, you've actually got the individual correspondence, which would be generated by the user. Um, now this system is sort of is full of detail actually, but if you just think uh, how that speed, speeds up. Uh, the, whole, the whole system is patented, um, and uh, when you take out a file of correspondence, you put the thing that's in the bottom right there, which is like a receipt, and that ensures that you know, they know where that missing correspondence has gone to, should they need to get it, and then you'd return it. But it's full of details, so for example, um, it might be too small to see, but there's a little number written on all of these files as well, so that actually when you return it, you don't have to look up the name, just refile it by number. So the whole thing sort of speeds up um, the process. The one on the right is sort of the um, kind of the next model up. And how that works is it's in a way a bit like the modern database that um, you have an index of correspondence names in this instance. Uh, and, uh, and you simply say what file number that correspondence belongs in. So if you've got Smith, Fred Smith, then you'd say he might be in number six. Okay. Um, and if you've got um, Thomas Jones, and they have to work for the same firm, you, he can point to six as well. So you can have lots of keys pointing to the same file. When you come to expand the system, you simply add more files at the end, because nothing ever, ever needs to get sort of uh, renumbered. Whereas if you try to expand that system, you, you, know, you have to start moving things around quite seriously. It's tremendously successful. Um, I'll give you some numbers. Um, so by 1908, uh, they got branches of RAND filing uh, in 40 cities in the United States and there's lots of overseas agencies, so it's really pretty successful. Um, this is a, a, another but somewhat different uh, example of filing. It shows the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company in the States, which would be very similar to the Prudential Insurance Company over here. And that big building there on the right uh, is it, and it, I think the caption says they've got more elevators and more type lighters than anybody else in the world. Uh, so it's a, it's a really big operation. This shows um, the filing system uh, for uh, what's called ordinary insurance, which is quite a high value, um, and there's a few hundred thousand policies. Um, now, you, you don't have loose, loose, leads of shape, loose, loose sheets of paper here, but what you have is a pre-printed card, because you want the name and address, the, you know, and a record of premiums paid, and that kind of information. Uh, so it's just kind of stored neatly in a card. And again, by the turn of the century, there's standard equipment <coughs> for this kind of activity. Um, this, so this shows some of it uh, here. Um, one where I think they're actually the same make as the ones that are being used by Metropolitan Life. Uh, again, these people supplied uh, these cards. You could get them pre-printed, and you could get them in, in different colour paper and so forth. So, as you design your system, and there was a whole sort of um, profession of systematizers, as they were called, who would sort of organise your office using this kind of equipment. Kind of the an early version of, of uh, a management consultant. This is a, again a fantastic image, and it's the same firm. Uh, metropolitan life, but this time uh, it shows the industrial life insurance. Uh, and this is for uh, low, uh, 
for working class insurance. So they're very small premiums. Uh, in Britain, it was like a penny a week, wasn't it? It's the same model, the same business model. Um, uh, and this shows one of the final exceptions. <coughs> if I show you, just to indicate the scale of this kind of filing activity. Um, so in 1917, so this is about 10 years on, when I find some records, there are 45 million policies. So that means there's 45 million cards. They sort of numbered from one, of course. Um, and they're stored in 75,000 filing drawers, and they have 210 filing clerks. So that's just people you know, managing the database, as it were. So this presumably is a really quite a small section. You know, there's got to be at least 10 times as much as this going on uh, to account for 210 filing clerks. Um, this time, that's my interest, how they organise the data integrity is that nobody except a filing clerk is allowed in this room. So if you wanted a, a record, um, you ask for it and, it and it would be retrieved for you and you'd have to leave the receipt and that's how they sort of manage the, um, the, the data security issue. As about an interest, this shows the, uh, the growth of metropolitan life at this period. It's rather amazing. Um, so that's the original postcard I showed you. On the right, you can see that they've, they've re replaced the church with this enormous tower, which is kind of double the size. So this is just full of clerks doing this kind of activity. Um, uh, well, of course, um, metropolitan life has long since moved to a computer somewhere in the suburbs. But it's still quite a famous landmark. That's a much smaller scale example from the 1930s. But again, you can see the two kinds of information here. You've got the filing cabinets uh, on the left, the vertical filing cabinets on the left, and the, uh, the, the much smaller index cards on the right. One of the problems with these card index systems is, is this sort of data security aspect um, that somebody can take a card and you know, that, that would really matter in the bank, wouldn't it, if somebody loses the account details. So Cardex is the firm that uh, addresses this. And Cardex is founded by James Rand Jr., so it's the son of, the, of, uh, of James Rand. Um, and this is the system. It's extraordinarily clever. Um, and how it works is that um, if you want to secure the code, you've probably seen this in the library, you can put a rod through them. Okay, that makes it extremely tedious to retrieve a card to take it out. So uh, Rand's idea is that you make the cards unremovable, but you have them arranged so that you can actually put information on them without actually having to remove them from the cabinet. So it's a rather elegant sort of cantilevered system here. You can see the woman on the right who's actually sort of uh, making entries in, into it there. Um, so again, uh, on the left there is, a, is a, they ran many advertisements for different industries. This particular one. Um, is for a uh, higher purchase, so going back to 1929, I think, uh, higher purchase on automobiles, so it kind of captures the expansion of the automobile industry and how that's <coughs> Um Again, uh, I estimate that you would store about 10,000 records in that little bank of cabinets. Really. This system was amazingly pervasive. Um, uh, just to give you some uh, data, so by 1920, there were 100,000 firms using Cardex, the Cardex system. It's got 90 branch offices in the United States. It's got a plant in Germany, and another plant in Germany. And there are 60 overseas offices. So this is a huge business. Um, and yet it's completely vanished. Uh, it's really hard to find anything, any mention of, of the Cardex system after about 1960. It just sort of just vanishes. <coughs> How many people learn? I mentioned the business of, of, uh, of systematizing, of uh, systems man who would do this for you. Or you could do it yourself. Um, and again, it was sort of part of the way, in, and it sort of pre, pre, prefigures the computer industry, that you've got these complex technologies and people have to learn to use it. So there is actually a Cardex Institute. So you could send your employees there, your office manager there, for a couple of weeks, and he would sort of learn, learn how you organize a system like this. And there's a big literature as well. So the example here is of stock control, uh, showing how you could organize the system to, to uh, manage your stocks. Well, James Rand Jr. is, is a considerable entrepreneur. 
and he starts to he recognise that there's a problem about data security, and he starts to amass other firms so that they can be a um, provide a better form of filing. This nice scare advert shows on the left you know, the consequences of a fire uh, on your business records. Unless, of course, you've got um, brand Cardex products, uh, in which case. <coughs> so he's merged with his father by this time. And they've got together um, at the behest of their mother that they should, they should join and make a single firm. Um, and they have, for example, this, they've acquired the same cabinet code which, which puts filing systems inside of a fireproof case and various other sort of technologies for, uh, for making them secure against water and fire and so forth. And then finally, um, the last thing that happens is the merger with Remington Rand. Um, people often think that Remington Rand, Remington Typewriter was the bigger firm, but actually it wasn't. Well, it may be the bigger firm, but the impetus really came from James Rand, who was a very considerable entrepreneur. Um, and uh, so he orchestrates the merger with Remington, and then it becomes sort of a one-shop stop, and they acquire the Powers Accounting Machine Company, and do punch cards, um, and um, Dalton Adding Machine Company, and quite a lot of other firms along the way. So it becomes this really big supplier of business systems. As a matter of interest, uh, in 1929, um, their sales, IBM, sorry, Remington Rand sales are 60 million dollars and IBM's a 20 million, so the firm is actually three times as big as IBM. And that persists really until after, after the Second World War. Um, it's curious, there is no biography of James Rand Jr., who strikes me as a very major business figure. You know, there are umpteen biographies of Thomas Watson of IBM, and yet you know, there is this very interesting character who merits a biography, which, um, which I shan't be writing. <laughs> Well, my, my last story, so I know I'm overrunning, but um, my last story is, is about um, computer design, so it's a, a piece of design history. Um, I can't claim much of originality for this, incidentally. The, the, as I looked into this, it turns out that there's a whole um, uh, academic sector that is interested in issues about design, and IBM is sort of one of the big subjects that they, they deal with. Um, some Ming secondary sources here. Um, this picture I, is a great way to, to look at it, I think. Um, it comes from the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, and yet, it looks curiously computer like, do you think? Um, it looks like it could be a mainframe. And really, I think that's no accident. Um, there are some things in the background there that look a bit like disk drives, but obviously are, are something entirely different. Um, well, this is really the story of Elliot Noyes, uh, who incidentally is a consultant uh, on the film 2001, so there's a sort of connection. Let me go back to the beginning of IBM and, uh, and its sort of design <laughs> processes. This is, a, again, a, a covered, <coughs> hand-covered slide from the 1920s. Um, showing IBM's equipment. And as you can see, it's in a, an office space. But that equipment looks like, looks like um, industrial machinery. So it's a curious, um, you know, it's striking that you have that equipment that looks like it belongs in a factory inside an office. Um, and what you've got there are a couple of sorting machines on the right and a tabulator and, and some uh, key punch machines on the left. Um, now, IBM, obviously, at that date, there's not much idea of industrial design anyway, and these are clearly not designed, they just look like machines. They do start to take more of an interest uh, in design sort of in, the, in the later 1920s. So, um, this uh, one in the background, that's sort of the, the left hand of the green picture on the left there, uh, shows the sorter, horizontal sorter, uh, that's introduced in the 1920s. Um, which has cabriole legs, Queen Anne legs. <laughs> what a strange thing to put up an office machine when you think about it. The only thing I can say is actually, when you look, it's surprisingly common. There was obviously um, a, a feeling amongst business machine uh, entrepreneur um, say, uh, manufacturers that uh, that was sort of how office machines ought to look. Um, and the one on the, uh, the tabulating machine, which is the other one on the left on the green picture, again, uh, has very little, it's entirely functional, isn't it? 
Um, the picture on the right <coughs> shows those machines in use. Uh, the same machines actually a sorter and a tabulator in an insurance company. And um, you can't quite tell whether you're in an office or, or in, a, in a factory. Uh, you can see it's been, it's been taken away from the office environment because it would be rather noisy and not unpleasant sort of equipment. This is um, IBM at its, its apogee uh, at the World's Fair in 1939, just before the Second World War. And it shows a range of equipment. And as you can see, what does it look like? Everything's got, got these uh, cabrio legs. Um, there's uh, some slight evidence of streamlining somewhere, so there's a little bit of uh, something coming in. Um, and it's all in this, this grey enamel, no, no colour at all. So, you know, pretty unimaginative on the whole. These pictures um, were published in 1949 by, uh, by Life magazine. <coughs> and it shows their tabulating machine set up. Presumably purchased shortly after the war. When surprisingly they're still using these designs, although it's hard to discern it, these particular pictures are just the same uh, as they were in the 1930s. As, as apart from the war, there's really not been much development, but stylistically they are the same. Uh, it starts to get the message. Um, so, you know, in the late 1940s, so this is the first real change. So on the left, um, you can see there's a touch of American streamline here in, in the rounded corners all looking a little bit like a frigid air sort of styling. And on the right hand side there, um, the 1948 card pen check, <coughs> showing um, again, that sort of slightly rounded crumb, but still this kind of grey crack on the enamel, pretty unpleasant set of machines. Um, the question I want to address, well, why do computers look the way they do? Um, but, you know, where, where does it come from? Uh, well, the first thing that sort of looks like a computer in IBM <coughs> is the Harvard Mark I, of which there are zero um, coloured illustrations. But one on the right um, shows the machine in use by the rating during the war. And it's designed by Norman Belgevis, who's sometimes called the father of American streamlines. So he's a very distinguished designer. And it was the first time that IBM had ever got a designer in, uh, and uh, Thomas Watson. Um, wanted it to sort of, uh, because the machine had been built, was a very ugly looking thing, and he wanted it sort of um, made presentable for the world. So it has these uh, kind of um, uh, brushed steel casings and glass doors and so forth. It's actually a very handsome machine. So that's Norman Belgedi. And the thing about that computer is it, it's really monolithic. It's one big lump of, uh, of um, hardware. Here's another example. Again, this is the IBM's SSCC, which is uh, 1948. Um, again, no colour pictures. That, that's IBM's best picture uh, at the top left. There's this glorious advertisement produced by the Shell Company, who was a user. They operated this machine. <coughs> it's actually um, operated in, in, the, in the headquarters in New York, which is why it's called the Oracle on 57th Street. So actually, the, the picture on that I've magnified just on the bottom left there. This actually shows a picture of, um, of the, sort of the front of the building. It's remarkably accurate, incidentally, if you compare it to the black and white picture above. So that's the image of the SSEC uh, in, the, in the IBM building. And people would sort of walk past it and, and admire it. Obviously being slightly fictionalised and putting the old film on the top. Um, but here are some other images of computers, really, really before they became, they sort of took their modern shape. On the left is the BINAC computer. Um, and this is the thing that came before the UNIVAC uh, when they were sort of feeding their way, the UNIVAC company. Um, and this is an artist's impression of what they were going to produce. Presumably, but he interviewed them, and this is sort of based on what he was expecting the thing to look like from having talked to him. As you can see, it's this kind of uh, you know, mechanical monster, this big lump of hardware. On the right, um, from the New Yorker, uh, you can see that what's there, it looks something like the SSEC that we saw in the previous slide. So this, um, although it's 1961 when that's produced, this is this kind of image in the background. And you see it in all the cartoons of the period, isn't it? You probably have to have seen if you think. They always have sort of dials and meters on them there, but it's like these monolithic objects. 
This is IBM, this is the Unibac when they actually start to produce it. And as you can see, the, the machinery just looks as though it's been dropped there. There's no arrangement. Um, the computer itself, which is in the background, is just enormous. I mean, there's stories about people putting a camp bed inside and being able to sleep inside it. Um, now, an enormous monolithic machine, which is sort of impossible to move, actually. Um, you kind of had to put the building around it. Um, here's a, more images from the late 50s of what computers were supposed to look like. The one at the top is from the film Death Set. I so lots of you have seen it. It's rather fascinating. But again, you can see this, this kind of computer monolith. Um, and IBM was an advisor on that film. And then on the right, um, there's quite a few cartoons sort of showing uh, computers at that um, uh, kind of electronic brain era. Um, that's a Looney Tunes one, I think. Um, <coughs> So this is IBM's first computer. <coughs> it has got some sort of differences. The photograph, the original photograph is on the right, uh, and you can see the machine is more modular. Um, they made a very sensible decision that you needed to be able to get a computer in, a, in an elevator uh, to get it to its site. Um, so they did actually make it in modular construction. It was generally then kind of reconfigured when it got to the plant. Um, the other thing there, and it's like a spot the difference quiz, isn't it? If you look at the picture in the, in the uh, advertisement and the photograph on the right, it's what Elliot Noyes calls the, the parlour and the cold cell problem. How much of the computer should you show? Should it all be undercover or should you show some of it? So you can see on the right, they've actually opened the cabinet up and you can see the works. It's actually rather really beautiful, aren't they, on the, on the circuit boards and so forth. Um, but actually, they, they got overruled by the advertising agency and then the doors have been shut in the image. Well, the two people there are Tom Watson Jr. Uh, and uh, Elliot Noyes. Now, let me just get my notes. <coughs> Thomas Watson was um, extremely conservative uh, in in design, um, he sort of knew what he liked. Uh, very old-fashioned, and Tom was sort of a potential. Tom Junior was a potential modernizer, um, and it's him that brings Elliot Noyes, this, this famous designer, or becomes a famous designer, uh, into IBM. I'll say a bit more about how that happens. This is IBM's Selectric Typewriter, and I think it's the most interesting advert. Although it says seven years proved electrical performance. So the machine came out in 1933. It's exactly the same in 1949, totally unchanged. Um, so he hires uh, Norman Bell Geddes, uh, to, who was the designer of the Harvard Mark I computer, uh, to redesign it. And the person who gets the job is Edward Noyes, who's uh, working for Norman Bell Geddes Associates. And that's what he produces. So it's a much more attractive looking typewriter um, in pastel colours. Um, though you have to say, if you look at other typewriters of the, of the era, they're all exactly the same. Rounded corners, pastel colours. So there's not sort of that much innovation going on. However, um, and I'll just finish the story about the typewriter. Um, <clears throat> seven years later on, I think about 1961, um, they decide that Elliot Noyes finally gets his head <laughs> and really redesigned it the way he would like it. And this is the famous um, IBM Selectric typewriter. Uh, and it's sort of interesting to see, because you're not something you associated with, with sort of information technology companies. That's his design studio. So all those typewriters you see on the table are actually made of clay. So they're just models as they sort of um, very like an automobile design shop, isn't it? You know, where they make things out of clay and similar. In the way. Um, just in the middle there, actually, it's such an iconic design, it eventually gets sort of in, features in a set of postage stamps that you issued by the US Post Office. Well, prior to the typewriter business, um, the first job that um, Tom Watson gives noise is to redesign the, um, the uh, the display in the, in the world headquarters on 57th Street, which I showed you earlier with the SSEC on. Now, um, 
I should explain the relationship uh, between Watson and, uh, and noise. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, They both lived in the same area, kind of uh, around, not far from New York, in kind of uh, Westport or somewhere, uh, Westchester, uh, kind of one of the suburbs of the US. So they're both quite well born. Um, and in the war, um, Noyes is already an amateur pilot, and in Johnny War, he becomes a pilot and instructor. And Tom Watson enlists as well, and he wants to learn to fly. So actually, Noyes is his flying instruction, that's really how they get to know each other. Um, and I suppose that uh, Noise is the young man, is a young man on, on the make. Um, he sort of um, uh, inveigles himself in, in, into, uh, into Watson and tries to educate him. Uh, so, um, and it's interesting if you, if you read uh, Watson's autobiography, he, has no, he obviously still doesn't know this happened to him. Um, but he's convinced it's his idea to bring Noise into the firm uh, to do the design. But what's actually been happening? Um, is that uh, noise has is very interested in European design. He doesn't like American steam. He wants this European design, sort of Bauhaus type of thing, and kind of Mondrian look. Um, and Olivetti is the leading office machine designer uh, in Europe, streets ahead of anybody else. Very, very modernist, as you will know. Um, so he starts getting his friend to send him brochures that he then feed, feeds by another friend, so he doesn't know where they're coming from, that they arrive on Tom Watson's desk. So he sort of gets infected with this, um, with this thing. So eventually, um, noise of educates him, takes him to art museums, takes him to the ballet, and sort of, this is not to say um, <clears throat> Watson was sort of a, a, um, a barbarian, but he was sort of culturally illiterate, and it, it's really noise who sort of educates him in this way. And his first assignment, as I say, is, is to redesign the, the, um, the showroom in the world headquarters. On the left is the thing, is the legacy of Tom Watson Sr. Uh, and as Tom Julie describes it, it looks a bit like the state rooms on the liner. Um, and when you look at it, you know, critically, especially if you're not a designer, but you can imagine how a designer looks at this, the incongruity of it. Um, you know, Persian carpets on the floor. Um, wood walls, this sort of deeply coffered ceiling um, with these ugly, these ugly monolithic machines stuck inside. I mean, it really is <laughs> it's hard to imagine, isn't it? Um, on the right uh, is um, Noise's redesign of the room. So what he does, uh, of course, there's not much you can do about the machines at this time. This is the 702, which is pretty much like the 701. Not much you can do about the grey of the machines. But what he does, he puts it against this br bright red wall. Again, it's hard to imagine how radical that was uh, in 1953. Um, and of course, uh, Tom Watson is very nervous about what his father's going to think of tearing all the <coughs> tearing all this beautiful like, panelling off the walls and so forth. And he apparently senior was delighted with it. So then um, Watson says, "Well, you know, you're hired." Um, and Noyce says, "I don't want to be hired, but I'll, I'll, work, I'll work with you, but not for you." So um, he works as a consultant for three quarters of his time for IBM. Um, because he, very wise, he knows that if he ever took a job with IBM, there would be three legs between him and Tom Watson. He would never get through the door. But in the moment, you know, this way, he has instant communication. Well, it, it takes off slightly slowly. The first thing he does is to let's have some, some color on these machines. So the one on the left, um, so to offer a choice of colour, uh, red, yellow, or blue. Um, this is, I think, a NASA installation. <clears throat> and it looks dreadful. It's all the old machines, but kind of re um, And uh, noise realise this is just terrible. Um, this, this, it's not what he intended. And, um, uh, so there afterwards, you can have one colour from IBM, but you can't mix the colours, because it, it just looks awful. Um, and this is his first, on the right, uh, is the RAMAC computer, the first disk computer, and, um, which he redesigns, or sorry, which he designs. Um, and what you've got there is, is interesting, this resolution of, of the uh, parlour and, and coal hole idea. So you can see that they actually expose the disk drive, and there's a glass door in the machine, you can just see uh, in the little image there. Uh, and that's sort of the way that disk drives sort of end up, they very typically, uh, you can see them through the glass thing, because they're rather, rather nice looking objects. Um, when IBM uh, designs the 1401, it's their first transistorized computer, 
uh, Noyes has the full design brief, and these are his design studies. And this is where the modern mainframe takes shape. And these are sort of the first photographs you see that look recognisably like a modern mainframe. Um, as you can see, a single colour. Um, you've got the floors with the concealed cabling underneath and the, and the tiled ceiling. So it's a very classic uh, look. And everything is arranged orthogonally, so right angles all over the place. No sort of random arrangement of, of machinery. And like objects put together, so all the tape drives are kind of put together. Um, this is a, an advertisement <coughs> that they produced for the launch of the 1401. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting that they're not trying to tell the user what colour to use, but you see that the pictures are all in black and white. But they've suggested these three colours that you might, you know, your colour options, which are called, to get this right, flame red, sun yellow, or sky blue are the, are the colour choices. It turns out that blue is the most, by far the most popular option, which is shown in the photograph at the, at the bottom there. It's said that's the origin of the term, term Big Blue. I don't know if it's true. <clears throat> now, what starts to happen after that period? Um, everything starts to look a little bit noisy uh, in this uh, um, noise like, I should say. Uh, in computer. This is an example, and you, you can find lots of examples like this. But this particular one is from uh, ICT. And what you've got in the black and white photos are their punch card machines. Those photographs are 1947. So they're actually machines were designed in the 30s. And in the pink image below, um, it's exactly the same machines. They're not, they tend to be refurbished or remanufactured at this stage. But they've all been put in these computer-like covers and arranged orthogonally. So this kind of has the computer look. Um, which, is, which is very attractive for people who can't afford computers but would like some punch card machine that doesn't look like it came out of the, the arc. Um, <clears throat> and Noise's sort of final flowering really at IBM uh, is Design System 360. Uh, and this is uh, sort of one of the design studies. Again, it's interesting, this is actually a one tenth scale tabletop model. So again, this isn't a computer, but it, you can see how they're kind of visualising what this what this machine would look like. And this is the, the white room. When Noise gets to IBM, he discovers there's a warehouse that's not been used for anything much at the back of the uh, of, uh, Poughkeepsie, I think. Um, it's 100 foot by 50 foot, it's an enormous space. Um, paints the whole thing white and uses this for, to sort of photograph the, uh, the machines against. So again, this is a photograph of, of um, from 360 or 370. Um, again, interesting, these, uh, these aren't actually computers, in fact, they're made of plywood. And again, it's all part of this, this design process of you know, how should the, the computer look for the user. Um, this is the iconic photograph on the left there of, um, of the IBM 360, this vertical view, which you see very widely reproduced. Um, which I think is interesting when you compare it with that image from 2001 as a kind of resonance. And uh, so the last slide, um, this is actually um, I ICL. And so it's 20 years on from System 360. Uh, so this is sort of the, uh, about 1989, so 25 years on. And the computer looks just the same. You know, it's become, uh, I call it a zeitgeist in the sense no IBM didn't say that's how you have to do computers. But there's a kind of consensus really that this is how you do computers. So what you've got, the tile floor with concealed wiring, tile ceiling with strip lighting, um, all these like objects put together, everything arranged orthogonally at right angles to each other, and a, sort of a, a bright, a bright livery. And it's hot tango, I think, is the colour that uh, ICL uses at that time. That's it, really. <laughs> well, well, sorry. Thank you. <coughs> Martin. Has anybody got any questions or comments? Oh. Um. <coughs> it's interesting that you illustrate the 360 and the promotional launch about the mainframe event following the 360 launch was this, this week. The ICL response at the time 
involved an industrial designer and there was a, a deliberate uh, attempt to design 1900 as a sort of coherent looking mm. beast or, or not so much beast to something modern and, and it got design awards and the man no one and who was employed and vehicle himself in the same way as you <laughs> describe um, yeah. uh, when they had the IBM equipment um, he, he had a powerful say in the design of the equipment and, ch and chose this uh, the story is he still chose the tank red the tank orange from a pot of paint down in his garage but, uh, <laughs> 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 that's a, uh, a comment about the hot tango. It was very, very popular with the customers, uh, and they went to considerable lengths, some of them, to try and get their other office furniture to match it. And yeah, it then emerged, I believe, that the process um, for producing it, actually a three-stage process, which involved baking, uh, at some point, so it was actually very, very difficult to get an exact, uh, exact replication. But see, certain people tried an awful lot, which they would certainly never have done with. I think the colours scheme for some of the late tabulators was something that was called Brazil, an estuary. Uh, I'm kindly dubbed as khaki and cow dung in certain quarters. <laughs> <laughs> it was certainly know. not very attractive. <laughs> I know the colour. I don't know how to name. <laughs> Um, just a minor comment. Um, do you know that Dijkstra would have disagreed with your ideas about colour? <laughs> um, I went to a conference which he spoke in the 70s and he was preceded by a number of Americans who had very swish presentations. Dijkstra came up with a blackboard and chalk and he began his talk by saying anything that can be written in coloured chalk can be written in white chalk. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds very Dykstra, I must say. <laughs> um, well, that's not. I know some of these photographs are faked for, for publicity, but the, 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 the shot you got of the SSEC that was on show in mm. New York, wasn't it famously in a room with two huge pillars in the middle of the room? That's and right. And they took the pillars out, or photographically took the pillars out for the photographs. So it said, it was, and I've seen pictures of both actually, yeah, so they did um, photoshop it as it were, to, so there were pillars like this, right, you know, holding the scene, yeah, too. and they were removed, um, which is typical of Tom Watson Senior, I think. <coughs> Done. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily a, a computer related thing, but certainly something to do with colour. I remember talking to uh, the curator of one of the coal mine museums, um, and he was desperate to get hold of some green paint to touch up the, uh, the, the changing rooms and various other places and he couldn't find it anywhere in any of the colour charts from any of the paint manufacturers. So eventually he phoned up a paint manufacturer and said, I need this particular colour but I can't find it anywhere. And the paint manufacturer said, oh you need NCB green. <laughs> Because that's the only person people they ever sold it to. It's like post office light straw. What was interesting, I thought, was the the computer on display. And we used to have the SIA computer, a uh, Victoria CDC sixty six hundred, and we had it in a damn great window, mm. and people used to come and look at it. And a few years later, we had to block the windows up. Well, not even a few years, because it was quite obvious that sooner or later someone was going to chuck a bomb for it. <laughs> and it's quite a completely different view of, of life, you know. Interesting change. Now, of course, it wouldn't take any space anyway, so yeah. it doesn't matter. There's an article in New Yorker um, describing this, uh, this um, they call it Popper, apparently, this SSEC. Um, and it was, it was a real, um, you know, a real attraction. Mm -hmm. People went out of their way to look at it, and it was, of course, also of great fascination to people. Mm -hmm. It was all part of that sort of electronic brain <coughs> era, and these machines are quite magical. On the subject of strange names for colours, um, I had to get an aeroplane resprayed using American twin-pack paints. 
and amongst the colours available, you, you might expect post office red or something like that, no, Coca Cola red and Pepsi green. That's the way the colours were named in this catalogue. <laughs> also related to flying, you mentioned Dalton. Um, one of the things anybody who's learned to fly will know is the Dalton computer, which is a piece of plastic with a circular dial on it, which automates working out vector triangles. Connected. Uh, but I, that's what I wondered. Are they connected? I suspect they're, they're not. I suspect Dalton was in the RAF and nothing to do with the American company. But I don't know. Um, I mean, they were totally mechanical computers, and then they were they were acquired by Remington Rand. They, the trademark, the name stayed around until the forties, I think, and then it sort of fades from view. Okay. <clears throat> uh, going back to the SSEC, it's kind of interesting. It made me think of what these computers were doing when people were looking in the windows, watching them. At least some of the time, in say 1949, the SSSE was running. Um, Monte Carlo simulations of hydrogen bombs. <laughs> <laughs> People coming along 57th Street watching a simulated fusion explosion <laughs> going on the this room. Kind of weird thought. <laughs> I think it's a shame we've probably had the best of it because I, mean, I spent some time in computer rooms of that size, which are now mostly not lit, rack upon rack with black mm. racks, freezing cold, and, and no people around, and there's no peripherals at all, just the racks. The same sort of sign things. Sorry, somebody put their hand up for a second. Yeah, so, so <coughs> yeah. Um, sorry, bottom on? Bottom on. It's on. Okay. Yes. Martin, you've written the business history of ICO. Um, you could actually do the product colour planning sequence of ICL, which a number of us have already referred to, and those of us who are a long time. I think it would be an interesting sub-study that you could follow through from the tabulators, 1900, lightly grey and blue, 2900 stuff went uh, tango and uh, silver, etc, etc. So there's, I think there's another sort of sub-lecture you could add into this at some stage. Another chapter for the reprint of uh, ICL. <laughs> 